All right, folks, welcome back. This is Yankees Unloaded. I'm Jake Allen Bogan. He is Gary Sheffield Jr. And we come to you following a win. So Gary, they had their first in the, the loss column. Uh, felt a little weird. Not as many people watch the, the losing game, so to speak. So especially when there's 162 games. So we're glad. I can't blame him. Yeah, I can't blame him either. It was an hour long and whatever. But uh, it's a win. Uh, six, five final in 11 innings and Gary, before I send it over to you, I'm just going to bring up one thing here that I noticed, uh, by a pretty solid Yankees account on Twitter, Yankees at Yankees light. These Yankees are different. They want an extra inning game on the road. On the road, the Yankees have lost 15 of their last 17 extra inning games and have failed to score 18 of their last 23 ghost runners. Today, they scored both ghost runners and four runs and extras. To me, that is what I'm going to take away the most out of this is that like for anybody that was like, oh, this is the same old Yankees. They're not grinding at bats today. I mean, that is to be expected coming off a 7 nothing beatdown. You want to come out and be aggressive, but to see what they were able to do in extra innings, it doesn't matter. I mean, they scored six runs. Gary, I don't think we thought they were going to score six runs at any point in this game. And then they unloaded, uh, you know, in extra innings. So look, I feel really good about this. A win is a win. And we got a lot of things to talk about, but Verdugo making his presence felt his big, uh, Bronx bomber moment hit a two run Jack. And, you know, I know obviously they blew the lead, but that was, that was a big moment for him. Yeah. And how about Rodon, huh? Yeah. I mean, we, we were talking about it yesterday. We were saying like, exactly, like exactly what are our expectations for Carlos Rodon? You mentioned you expect him to essentially go four innings, which I said a $160 million pitcher four innings is just not acceptable. But if you actually watch the way that this game went, I thought Rodon pretty much schemed his way off the field in the fifth inning or the sixth inning there, and he could have made this outing much longer than what it was. But this is what I will say. I think if Carlos Rodon is really honest with himself and he watches what he did today, it's very clear what he does well and what he doesn't what do well. For one, anytime he's pitching down in the zone, which normally to the average pitcher seems like a good thing, but if you aren't paying attention to Rodon for the most part, all of his misses are above the strike zone, which leads you to believe it's intentional. I know yes. Network brought up Michael K brought it up. A few of those guys on yes. Network brought it up and they said, yeah, he's starting to overthrow the ball. And actually I disagreed. I thought that was his intention. I thought Carlos Rodon is a good enough pitcher to have an understanding of where am I trying to go with the baseball? And anytime I see a guy miss 15 to 20 times in a game, above the strike zone at some form or fashion there's an intention there so Mm. when i saw rodon get hit for the most part he was down and in in the zone and guys were pulling the ball to left field but when he was throwing the ball up and away he was having success you saw it with christian walker and that at bat obviously walker wasn't very happy uh we heard some uh we heard some cursing on the tv which was fun (laughs) like always but yeah when rodon was having success He was getting his fastball up to 97, 98 miles an hour. And shockingly, the cutter was actually pretty good for him today. I wasn't expecting any success with that pitch. But what was interesting about the cutter is that the cutter was the only pitch he successfully threw on the inner half of the plate. Everything other than the cutter, if it was inside, it was ripped. So it tells me that Rodon's fastball location on the inside part of the plate needs to be much better. It needs to improve because he can become much more efficient than what he is currently. But on the bright side, Rodon's fastball being 97-98 all game long. Remember, Jake, I said it's great if he's throwing 98 in the first inning. means he's got a live arm. But when you really get an indication of how a guy's arm's feeling is in the third and fourth inning when he's settling in, the adrenaline's gone, and you actually start to see what a guy's working with, that stuff didn't go away. So that was a really good sign for the Yankees. And without that, there's not much to be excited for this year. But when you have a Rodon who's got his arm back, I mean, at least the ceiling reappears. So I'm actually really excited about the way this game went. Yeah, I mean, his ERA is 
two seven nine. I know it's early in the season, but yep. if they he finishes anywhere near that, you're going to be excited about it. I thought he pitched. You know, he he gave us moments where you're like, okay, I feel good about the future with him. You know, in the immediate future, uh, this to me was much better outing than the last one. Got into two bases loaded jams, got out of them both against Houston, but still got into two. And it's not funny, Gary. He gave up more runs in this outing than he did against Houston. I thought this was much better than Houston. He also went longer. Um, he really odd, uh, you know, moment there when he was being taken out. It's almost like Yes Network had no idea what to do. So they just like cut to commercial. But did you see that? But they were, yeah. he was like yelling at Boone. I don't think he was yelling at Boone. I think he was so mad at himself. But regardless, it just looked hilarious on TV. Well, that's kind of what we signed up for, wasn't it? Because yeah. Carlos Rodon is a different type of personality. It's part of the reason why last year and we had Josh Donaldson in our locker room was because the whole idea was that this Yankees locker room needs more fire. We have a lot of nice guys. We've got leadership. Yeah. I mean, we've got pretty much all the qualities you would want. But it didn't seem like we had that fiery guy. So when we went and got Carlos Rodon, it almost seemed like we were sending a different message to the locker room saying, we need a guy that we can slam the ball in his glove and say, let's go get six innings out of you. We need a big outing out of you. And a lot of those guys that we have in our in our locker room, for the most part, are more soft-spoken, more professional, I guess you can say. And not to say Rodon's not a professional, but he is the type of guy who might chew out his manager. He's the type yeah. of guy who has the nerve and the confidence, most importantly, to do those type of things. So I just saw a competitor, someone who wanted more of himself, even though we got a lot out of him. I did say coming into this outing, this was actually a much harder matchup than Houston was, in my opinion. I know Houston's got a better lineup, but when you look at the Arizona Dimebacks, they've got a lot of right-handed hitting. It's a lot. It's yeah, Christian you, Walker. You it's Ketel Marte. It's this, a lot of guys. This lineup. You said, I mean... You warned people about this lineup. You said, you know, last last episode, last night, you're like, I don't love this matchup for Rodon. And I mean, I got to give a lot of credit to, to Merrill Kelly. I thought he did a really nice job getting through an order that was really patient. Um, He was just like, I'm just going to hit, uh, pound the strike zone. 64 yeah. of his 91 pitches strikes. Um, and, and I think that's the thing that people don't really understand is it's hard to grind out at bats when you're just fouling it off consistently, it's a lot easier when, you know, pitchers want you to chase and you're just like, I'm not, I'm laying off that. You couldn't really lay off Merrill Kelly. He was pounding the strike zone. And I think that's kind of the difference is yes. Well, I think the Yankees came out with a different approach today, following a shutout seven, nothing. They wanted to come out aggressive. I also think Merrill Kelly, the way he was pitching them was really putting them in a situation where it was like, I mean, I don't really have a choice, right? If I take two we pitches look like right down the plate. Mode. Yeah, we look like 2023 mode in like the beginning of this game. It yeah. was one of those games where oh, it just yeah. seemed like, again, we would never score ever. And that's the good news. Because remember I said this Yankees team, for the most part, has felt a little front runner-ish um, last year, where it felt like if we didn't score three or four runs in the first four or five innings of every game, we're probably going to have to either grind out a two to one game or we're just going to lose and lay down. This Yankees team is very different. We already had two come from behind games in Houston, which we hardly ever did. Not just last year, many years before. I think prior this is the fourth come from behind of the season. Is it, is it four? So that's four really impressive six. in itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's really impressive. And today, believe it or not, I know we Holmes and Volpe just did their thing to try to blow this game. But let me say this. It felt like the Yankees stole this game because Jake actually brought this up before the sh before the show yesterday. And he said, I feel like we almost have to win tomorrow. Like it feels in terms of momentum or returning home, winning tomorrow would just be huge. And I think we both agreed there. I think a lot of people who were listening agreed with that message. It almost felt like we lost a little bit of momentum. We went backwards in terms of our approach. We were talking about umpires and we came in today, the umpiring really wasn't much better. It was pretty much booty water all day. Pretty, pretty much the same thing. Just a younger dude behind the plate. <laughs> yeah, he was younger and somehow had just as bad a vision. It was terrible. <laughs> but you know what? The calls were bad on both sides. There were some calls yeah. for Arizona today that were terrible. You know what? And that one strike we, Ian Hamilton got, I was like, and I, that dude, Um, I forget who it was. I, actually, I could tell you right now. It was Barnhart. Barnhart took like... Was it? 
Yeah, remember, Kay was like, so Barnhart takes a walk, and he was he walked almost all the way down to first. Yeah. Like, he needed a breather because he was about to lose his mind because I thought that was insane. I mean, and, and this is the thing. Gary and I just want fair balls and strikes calls. We're not like, mm-hmm. oh, it needs to be fair for the Yankees, and I don't care what happens. Like, I'm not even that person. I want it fair. And if it's not fair, I want robos because the, the fact of the matter is this. At this point... If Ian Hamilton is throwing a pitch at your neck and they're calling that a strike looking, what can you do? You just screwed his entire at bat approach. That's and right. Now, it's for us, he strikes in the out, long run. It might not be. He, yeah. And he strikes out on a pitch where he swung and the ball's high heat. And he's like, yeah, you said that was a strike. What do I, what do I do? That's the problem with the lack of consistency. We saw that in at bats today. I think I mentioned that to Vol- uh, to you about Volpe. He got screwed on a call and then totally threw off his approach. And Torres also, there were just so many bad calls, but let's not focus so much on that. Uh, we'll do that in losses. <laughs> but right. the, the uh, in, in this win, in this win, Ian Hamilton was lights out two and two thirds innings. I do see why he's not the closer. It's because he's too valuable giving you multiple innings. That's the only reason he's not the closer in the New York Yankees at this point, because I think it probably is the most valuable position for this Yankees team. The way we use our rosters, if you really yeah. think about it, Aaron Boone, and he's tried to do a better job of it this year, trying to squeeze that extra out or two out of his starter. So I'm going to give him credit, but for the most part, the Yankees have gotten complacent with the fact that we're going to go high leverage low innings with our starters and guys are going to have to come out in high leverage situations in the fifth six and seventh that's essentially our bridge innings if the yankees control the game in five through seven you're in trouble and sure enough today when you watch rodon come out of the game it felt like okay The Diamondbacks at some point are going to come through here. It felt like the Yankees were going to let the game go. And sure enough, when Hamilton comes into the game and you started to realize, oh, he's got his stuff, it almost felt like it was just this Swiss Army knife just completely changed the game. It was a complete game changer for us. But then you move him to the ninth inning, it might change the way the game feels. Do you feel differently about the game if Clay Holmes has to come out in the fifth or sixth inning? Me personally, I think that's a loss if Ian Hamilton is not dead center in that game. So it's hard to just say our best. He came out in a jam too. People forget about that. There were two guys on. And that's the thing. What do you want Boone to do? Because I saw people like, just let Rodon Mm -hmm. finish it out. He's got 95 pitches. Boone doesn't trust Rodon yet. And he shouldn't. You know, we need to see this consistently. And this is not necessarily a amazing outing. This is like, you know, we're willing to work with you. This is, we'll take this. This is good. This is, this is improvement. We want to see you built back up to where, you know, we signed that $160 million pitcher, you know? So I don't blame him putting in a guy who he trusts Hamilton four strikeouts, two and two thirds innings in the comments section. Someone asked, is Hamilton hurt? Why has he not been out there the last three games? Fair mm-hmm. question. The dude yeah. is absolutely electric. Um, Luizaga pitched well today. Holmes, I'm going to defend with every fiber of my being here. I thought Holmes pitched great. And and you know me, I, I've been very critical of Holmes. Holmes no, had, I know you're being fair here. Holmes had his stuff. Holmes got ground balls. What do you want Holmes to do when the defense can't make proper plays? Volpe almost cost him the game. We love Volpe on this channel. Okay? Yes, we do. We do. But Volpe today almost cost the Yankees this game. That that throw was terrible. Now, I want to actually throw something at you. Um, and and I, I texted you this. Doesn't it seem a little ridiculous in a non-contact sport? I understand maybe at, at you know the catcher, when you used to run into the catcher, if they don't hold the tag, whatever. In a non-contact sport, though, doesn't it seem ridiculous that that's not an out just because the ball dropped? I mean, to me, like... He makes the tag and it's in his glove for a second and then pops out because he hit his shoulder or whatever. I think that's an out. You're out. It was almost like a hybrid play of that A-Rod. Remember he slapped the glove and the ball goes squirting out? Exactly. felt a little bit like that. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that, to be quite honest It's one of those kind of gray areas. And it's one of those gray areas because it never happens. 
Yeah, I was going to say I wouldn't change the rule just for the simple fact that it never happens. And to be honest with you, if there's anything to be mad at, it's the fact that my gold glove shortstop isn't making a routine throw. I expect him to make it next time. It's not an issue. But yeah. you can't blame an inning or How I about guess catcher's ear interference. That was laughable. Like it helped the Yankees, but like it's a joke. <laughs> Grisham, it's a joke of a call. It reminds Gr- me of Jacoby Ellsbury. Grisham hit the for those of you who don't know, Grisham hit the lace of the glove. And then immediately, like when he waited and then he saw, oh, that was a crappy hit. And then he pointed and he's like, and then the umpire's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> there was no like review. Like, no, I don't Piper's think his interference called. is a joke. And I think that a lot of people understand the call's a joke because the whole broadcast, and I was watching the yes out. They were laughing. They were talking about, thanks to Jake. And they're literally sitting there going, why doesn't a hitter who's just not playing well just do that? And the yeah. fact that you can talk about essentially exactly. circumventing the rules to get on first base. Yeah, I get it's the rules. It's the way baseball has always been, but some rules are meant to change and some rules are meant to stay. That's one of the rules that are just not good. It's no, not. the spirit of the rule is if like essentially, okay, it's any part of your bat hitting the glove and that's catcher's interference. But what the point of it is, is you don't want a giant cut of a swing to come through and hit all glove. And then you strike out because of it or whatever. That's catcher's right. interference. Mm-hmm. Hitting the lace, which has no impact really at all. I mean, that bat is being swung at a, at a high degree of uh, speed. And he still made contact with the ball. It was not a good... It was it was not a good at bat. It was not a good swing. And because he, you know... It's like... This is kind of an example, though, of our channel. Is that we're going to keep it real here. And it's like, I'm okay and I'm I'm man enough and, you know, I'm not too much of a fan here to admit that Grisham didn't deserve that. And that call, that rule needs to be looked at because that that could be an issue. Um, but sticking back, going back to the pitchers, again, thought Clay Holmes was really good. The fact that he gets a win, but he gets a blown save almost seems unfair. And the fact that Caleb Ferguson gets a save is kind of interesting because the fact, like... Honestly, you could argue that he should get the win, right? Like right. in a sense, it's it, it's just it's weird. Like the, we talked about this, how a guy comes out like heel comes out, they're up five nothing. the The game never changes. Like no one really ever scores anything. the The, the lead is never in doubt, but he can't get the win because he didn't pitch five innings. It's like one of those things, like where there's a lot of just those up in the air. I know this is how MLB is, but it's just kind of weird. Yeah, it is. And, and can I can I say one thing on Rodon? Because I actually want to go the opposite way. Because you mentioned something about trust. Yeah. And trust is a big thing when it comes to staying on the mound and all those debates of whether or not a pitcher should stay in. When does he come out? How much does a manager trust this pitcher to say, hey, I know all analytics point to me coming off the mound right now, but just put trust in me. Something Garrett Cole obviously has with Aaron Boone. But let me say this about Rodon. I don't think the reason he came out had anything to do with his lack of location, that inning in particular, or the fact that maybe he wasn't pitching as well as he was in the in the middle of the game. I don't it think it had anything count. to do with that. I don't even think it was the pitch count. Let really? me say this. Yeah, I don't. Here's why. In my opinion, based on the fact that Boone's been trying to get more innings out of his starting pitchers, he did it with Marcus Stroman just a few days prior. In my opinion, sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with the pitcher. When the Yankees have scored two runs the whole game, you cannot surrender another, and you cannot surrender another run. Oh, yeah. If the Yankees had four or five runs in this game, the way that we all would expect them to, because when we looked at this matchup, we said, Yesterday with Zach Gallon, it's not a good matchup for the Yankees. Frankly, no. it's a really good pitcher, one of the best pitchers in baseball. Merrill Obviously Kelly wasn't today, a good matchup for the Yankees today. Merrill Kelly, not a great matchup, but we said we can see more success today. I think it's more realistic to expect us to do something today. Now, yeah. having said that, once the game materializes and Merrill Kelly goes out and he does what he does, he pitches fantastic, it changes the way that you can manage Rodon. When you get into a situation where the tying run, the go-ahead runs on base, it's going to change how you manage that pitcher. But yeah, if the Yankees and if Juan Soto is not 0 for 5 and Volpe is not 0 for 5, combined 0 for 10 between the two of those, 
some of the hottest bats in our lineup, yeah, we probably have more runs and maybe we can give a longer leash to Rodon. But given the situation, I thought it was the correct move to go to, you basically got yourself in a jam and you went to our best pitcher and Ian, Ham and Ian Hamilton. They did exactly that. It worked perfectly. Now the rest of the game, Loisaga was fresh. Holmes pitched really good. We made a big error in the 10th inning, cost us that inning. And we went out and got off the mat and won a game. So yeah. I thought Rodon was excellent today. In my opinion, he probably would have given us six full had it not been for the score of the game. So I'm going to give all the credit to him because he looked erratic at the beginning of this game and he figured it out. He got hit hard a few times. He could have shelled up and, and essentially packed this one in and he didn't do that. He did the same thing that Nestor Cortez did yesterday. So I was really proud of what he did and hopefully it means something down the road. Yeah, that's the hope. Um, it's funny. You were, you were talking about when we were talking about Jake cousins, you were talking about arm slot, bro. That guy, Ryan Thompson has the most bizarre freaking the Yankees don't want to see Ryan yeah. Thompson again. No, he reminds me of the dude from Tampa. You remember the the power guy throwing 100 for Tampa? The super tall dude. He was like 6'7". Oh, yeah. Yeah. And whoever that guy was, it, it honestly was, it felt similar. Yeah, that, that stuff is so brutal. Like just dealing with that. Because I they, yes always does a nice job of pointing stuff like that out. Like his arm slot, it looks like his arm is pointed right at you. Like if you're mm -hmm. like literally if you are a left-handed batter, this ball's going right into your sternum whether you like it or not. And then it just breaks inside and you're like, "What?" <laughs> That's right. It, it's just crazy. But you know who we need you know who we need to bring up though and we we've I feel like we've saved it for last because it's probably the most important thing is Aaron Judge. Oh, how yeah. About, well, we were talking about, about his pitchers first. Now let's yeah. talk about the hitters. How about those at bats? Aaron Judge today woke up. Yeah. And we have it in our ticker below. Um, Aaron Judge woke the you know what up. I mean, he is back. This that's the thing. When you saw because you had mentioned 91 mile an hour fastball, Aaron Judge is late on. That's not Aaron Judge. That's Aaron Judge in a slump. That's Aaron Judge not quite ready for the season. And we have pounded the stump as to why we have not given up on judge. We have explained Aaron judge did not get those last, those second half spring training at bats that Soto got that Verdugo got all these guys got right. And I agreed with it because here's the thing. It's no different than in the NFL where you set your starters, right? You don't give them any sort of run in the preseason and what does that do? It 100% guarantees they're going to be ready starting the regular season. But what does it also mean? They could potentially, it could be a short-term pain for a long-term gain. As in, early on in the season, they might be a little rusty. You that's do right. that. And that's the right move, in my opinion. I'm always for him that. in particular. Yeah, exactly. so for Aaron Judge. 31-year-old center move. fielder yes. at that size, who's coming off like last year with the whole, well, if the Dodgers stupid stadium didn't have whatever the hell that was, I I'm still pissed about that, but the whole foot issue, you know, it's, it's like situational it, because it, think about it this way. The diamondbacks made the same move mm -hmm. yesterday with Corbin Carroll. They we said, laughed at that. We're, we, we had to laugh at it. I mean, they sat <laughs> Corbin Carroll because they said, Oh yeah, short-term pain, but long-term gain, short-term pain. This guy's like 22. <laughs> why is he not playing and and this is something that yes network can admit it's something our broadcast will happily admit hell even the Diamondbacks broadcast probably should admit it but they're probably not going to cross I guess their own organization but we're going to give you an honest take here some players you can do that short-term gain long-term whatever whatever it is you can make that move but yeah for certain players in our organization it's just not the case Guys like Anthony Volpe, guys that we want to essentially get their feet wet in the season, Oswaldo Cabrera, if they're hot, you play them every single day. If They you, they have to give you a reason not to play. But some exactly. players like Aaron Judge, who we know for sure are locked in superstars, yeah, we want those guys to be ready to play. And if he's, if he's off his timing for the first week and a half of the season, we're not going to complain because, to be honest with you, a month and a half from now, we're going to forget about all these games. We're just going to remember that they count in the standings. 
So it's just important to remember that the Yankees are trying to find a happy middle ground of how to keep all these guys healthy while also not trying to shortcut this process because we're not a shoe in to win this division. So we need all these games, but at the same time without Aaron judge, we're not going anywhere either. So we have to figure that out. You know, what's funny. Juan Soto gets credit for the run on that balk. <laughs> he did nothing today. He got, he, he did no, a good he got, swing in the 10th, but that he was got a terrible. run though in the, in yes, the, he did. Isn't that hilarious? Yes. That's yes, also is. another one of those. What <laughs> baseball? I, oh man. Baseball has some weird stuff. Um, Glaber had some nice at bats in particular, the one he sent out opposite field. That was huge. Uh, judge. I, I was definitely not done talking about judge. I mean, the home run that was great. The walk, the way he was grinding the at bats. And the thing is, this actually is a really good point here that I'm about to make because we were just talking about grinding at bats, how you really can't do that when you're going up against a guy that punches, just completely pounds the strike zone in Merrill Kelly. However, Aaron Judge took advantage of the fact that what the hell is his strike zone? No one knows. And he got some of those calls where because he you know didn't swing here, didn't swing there, doesn't always work in his favor as we talked about yesterday, but... It did this time, was able to work at bats, wait until he got his perfect pitch. Rizzo got two hits in this one. That was nice to see. Uh, you know, Volpe, not the best game of the season. Obviously didn't get a hit, but did get a run. Um, Verdugo with the home run, and we'll we'll touch more on that. Austin Wells. You already know. I don't care this. what Austin Wells did today. He's a better option than anything else we got by far. He took really good swings if you watch the game. Yeah. If you didn't watch the game, he had a hit. Tell you, the fact that he took good swings in itself and he wasn't a problem behind the dish, he's already our starting catcher. So I want him penciled in tomorrow. If he's not, I'm going to be upset. I'm here to tell yeah. you. He's an everyday catcher. Or I guess we have the day off tomorrow. Yeah. We'll still put out content in some capacity. We'll have to figure it out. But probably not yeah. doing a uh, a breakdown of a game that we don't know the lineup for yet or anything like that but maybe just kind of a recap of the games i don't know we'll figure it out um grisham i don't think grisham should be in the lineup over john birdie you know i i, I just don't um birdie just i feel so much better when he's at the dish than than grisham um i do see now why people are like yeah, don't get too excited about the Grisham pickup with Soto. He's just kind of a throw-in. He really oh, is just this. a throw-in. My whole family lives in San Diego, and they're they're Padres fans, so they've been telling me about Grisham. They, they're not fans. Now, I haven't offered my opinion yet on Grisham, so please, YouTube, do not take that as my take, okay? Yeah. Uh, Grisham is a really good defensive center fielder. If he gives you – he essentially has got pop. He's not going to make a ton of contact. He's very streaky. He's pretty much Aaron Hicks, but a better fielder. That's really what it is. And that's what the Yankees, frankly, need. Because if you really look at this roster, we're not in a situation where we need Trent Grisham to play every day. No. That's not the situation. Aaron Hicks was in a different spot than that. Aaron Hicks played center field with Aaron Judge in right field. Saw it often. Okay, But Trent Grisham's out there to play a solid defensive center field. It's a way to get Aaron Judge off of his feet, which you saw today as he DH'd. Okay. We also have got Jason Dominguez coming back later this year, Spencer Jones, who's one of our top prospects, who again is another outfielder. So the Yankees have to figure out ways to get guys off their feet. Some of our best players in our organization, Juan Soto, another guy in the outfield. You need to get guys off their feet, and you can do that by putting a sure handed center fielder out there who, frankly, might surprise you with his bat every once and again, but our expectation is that defensively he doesn't make any mistakes out there. He's getting great jumps, and we don't have to put a six foot seven basketball player body out in center field. Oh, That's the reward. But can uh, I mention, by the way, real quick about yeah. Glaber Torres? Because in my opinion, he did the most important thing that absolutely no one is going to talk about. And I guess maybe you can argue why would they? But approach has been so important coming into this year. And it's been the noticeable difference in the wins, especially come from behind wins, because it means that you didn't start the game well and something had to change for you to win the game. That's what come behind wins are. But if you look at Glaber Torres later in this game, 
he got into a situation where he was facing a guy who frankly did not have the stuff to get him out, a player of his caliber. Glaber Torres missed a 91 monitor fastball right down the shooter. Okay. Everyone on TV, oh wow, Glaber really missed a pitch there. Clearly frustrated, waving his bat, steps out of the box, taking his time. He was he was upset. Okay. I was upset. I was so upset that I text Jake and said, How does he miss that pitch? Now, classic Glaber Torres would try and leave the yard to left field and essentially change the game and make up for the past mistake that just happened. He missed a pitch that he should drive. Instead, what did he do? He sprays the ball the other way and moves it to the next guy in the lineup. Now, Juan Soto didn't do anything, but what it means is that we're committing to our changes that we're putting forward. Most of the time, everyone's fine making adjustments as long as it's working in the short term. But what happens when you get punched in the mouth and it doesn't work? Do you go back to your old habits? Do you try to revert back to 2017 and show people what you're made of? Or do you just commit to what it is that we're setting forward? And that right there, at the very least, was a little snippet of why I think Labor Torres, why I think Oswaldo Cabrera, Anthony Volpe, a lot of guys in this lineup are adopting this new approach that even if we don't score in the first four or five innings, eventually we're going to get you because our habits are good. So I just love seeing that. And I think it's going to make everybody a better player. So, you know, it's funny you should bring that up. I actually was going to talk about that. I bad. I have it brought up here on the uh, play by play. McGuff is pitching. You get a foul ball, foul ball. You're down. Oh, two. You take a ball. Then you foul off three straight pitches. And like you said, spray an opposite field one there. Move birdie to third, who is at this point. This is, by the way, the start of the 11th inning. This is a big time at bat. Soto uh, comes up and, you know, strike looking, not a strike. So he gets kind of hosed on that one. Then a foul. Uh, trying that uh that swing that comes out when you see that he's just trying to do too much. Mm-hmm. Like he he definitely wanted to, you know, send that thing in order a bit. Uh then he has a stri- you know, a, a foul ball on a splitter down. Kind of had to swing at it, put himself in that position. And then he hits the splitter that I mean, it's like a little inside, uh still a strike. And he crushed it. But unfortunately, the center fielder makes a, a nice play, jumps up in the air and, and stabs it. Then you get Judge to double the center. And the thing is, they were playing back in the outfield because they want to keep everything in front of them. Judge hits it over that. Yes, so he does. when he so does that, that's in a row of excellent approach. That's, yeah. that's what's standing out to me. So Birdie already scored because of that balk, which is hilarious. Um, Judge doubles to center, scores Torres. Also, it's funny. I don't think Torres is the fastest, but he's very smart on the base paths. I oh, definitely, definitely don't think he gets fastest. in. Yeah, he's not, but I don't <laughs> think he gets enough credit for that. Um, and the thing that sucks is I actually, you know, Rizzo's at bat sucked. I didn't like that. But then Volpe comes up and I thought he had a good approach and then he unfortunately fouls out. Um, and then, you know, Holmes ended up hitting Walker. This is where, this is what I wanted to touch on. He strikes out Suarez on the nastiest pitch he threw all day. Right. And then Boone takes him out. I actually think that was a mistake. Oh, when he took him out after the hit by pitch. No, he took him out after the strikeout. He kept him in after the hit by pitch. Then he takes him out of the strikeout. So Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, you saw the first inning that he was in and clearly Clay Holmes just, he he was getting ground balls. He was generating ground balls and the defense just wasn't doing any, doing him any favors. Was Gets that the bat that where he, where Alexander was coming up and Peterson pinch hit? No, Suarez struck out swinging. He hit Walker. Yeah, so he hit Walker. He struck mm-hmm. out Suarez, right? Yeah. And then he came out. Oh yeah, he came out and then Peterson Barosa. Yeah, so right. So that's so I my think thing. He might have done that because when Alexander was coming up, okay. So when Alexander was coming up, he's swinging a hot bat. He's a right-handed hitter. It seemed like the Yankees just decided that they didn't want him to face 
the lefty. Was that it? Well, I don't even see Alexander here. Did he get? He was he pinch, pinch hit. hit? I don't did. know why you would do that. That's stupid. Yeah, so they pinch hit him because it was righty on righty. And I think the Yankees' rebuttal to that was that we're just going to go with somebody else. That Okay, I might have missed that. Because, oh, well, yeah, it didn't even occur to me that they pinch hit Blaze. That, that, I, that is, I, that, that's that when Jace dumb. Peterson came in the game. See, that to me is over managing. That guy a hit lot. a bomb earlier, an absolute right. bomb. I'm yeah. not taking a guy like that out late in the game. That's insane. But, okay, I guess that makes sense. Um, I like Caleb Ferguson, no issue with him pitching. And, you know, I've already been criti- you know, critical of home. So it's not like I'm just jumping around. Oh, I'm defending him here against it. I'm just trying to keep it real. Holmes pitched well enough to get the win, not blow the save. Defense let him down, Volpe. And then I thought after the strikeout, you see that they hit by pitch. And it was a, it was a breaking ball that just didn't break, right? So bad pitch. And then he completely is back in the zone in the Suarez at bat. I would have kept him in there regardless of the matchups. And I understand the matchups now because um, I wasn't thinking about that at the time, but I would have kept him in there. And I still think they, they win if they do that. Um, I'm just glad it didn't come back to bite them. Barosa's single. I also want to point out was only a single because everybody in the outfield is playing back to keep everything in front of you. That's an out in the first inning. You know what I mean? Yeah, the good news here is that the fact that we burnt Ferguson and the fact that obviously we use Holmes and Holmes, I, I think we both can agree that he pitched well enough to win this game. Yeah. Um, the defense just didn't make enough plays behind him. Rizzo, again, wasn't good defensively today. Volpe no. making a horrendous throw, but he'll be better. But we have a day off tomorrow, and then we return back to Yankee Stadium. So, And then we got Marcus Stroman, who Marcus Stroman's probably our most reliable big inning guy that we got right now. So how about that? So because he didn't, yeah, because <laughs> I, they wanted to make him the ace and pitch the first game and he declined. That's right. So now because he did that, he's going to be starting the first game of the, the home opening series at Yankee stadium. Dude, that is going to be electric. Not only that, playing? it was electric tonight or today. Yeah. Who are you playing in the home, home opener? They're playing, uh, the Blue Jays. Oh, yeah. Did you let me, see, let me see a preview? Vladdy Guerrero Jr. Oh, had another. Cucci, this dude's pooty cheeks. If we don't <laughs> rake, I don't know what we did. Kikuchi <laughs> is not good. I don't care what anybody says on YouTube. I don't care what anybody says on Twitter. He's not good. If we can't hit Kikuchi, and, and this is not saying I'm going to hit him. This is not it, hitting yeah. is not easy. Okay. But this is a matchup that the Yankees should just absolutely punish. This should oh, be before we touch on that real quick, Joe, because I'm even somewhat confused. Maybe you can give me some clarity. Why was the pitcher <laughs> hitting in the final? They ran out of bench. They ran out of bench. Did you see that? So, did, okay. So again, the over management, right? Yes. Um, But I understand that. So you're telling me they pinch ran Jake McCarthy and we're just like, nah, not going to put him in the game. Like they, they like they pinch ran McCarthy in that nine hole and he couldn't play shortstop. And so they basically said, we're not going to make a defensive substitution. We're just going to have the pitcher. So they did that. And then think about it. It's like when you, you, you're, you know, it's like a check in, uh, in chess. Boone literally saw this. It was like check and then checkmate because he's like, oh, the pitcher is up next. They're not going to do anything about that. Intentionally walk Moreno right now. Yeah. Like, I'm not gonna, essentially, why am I going to give Moreno a chance as a regular hitter no, to win the game? Wouldn't. You know, I'll, right. I'm like, oh, okay, bring up the pitcher. But that's part of the drawback of trying to be too smart in bringing out Blaze, Blaze Alexander. That's the problem. It's so See, stupid. I get trying to get a matchup, but... You have to remember, after you make a substitution, you have to think about what are we risking and what comes next. That's what a manager does. You just you weigh cause and effect, pros and cons. 
The pro is, okay, we're going to be having a lefty come up against Clay Holmes. But a smarter manager, and I mean, their, their manager's plenty smart. He should be able to realize that the Yankees still have Ferguson, who's still fresh in the bullpen. So Ferguson came into the game. The Yankees had an answer to that move. Easy out, end of the inning. Well, you go into extra innings, you no longer have a bat. So once you get to the bottom of the order, the Yankees just basically have this free out at the end of the lineup. And you have to know that. So they essentially took a gamble that they were just going to cash in right then and there. Once they didn't do that, it was advantage Yankees. So that's the good news. And then, of course, us burning Ferguson, I said earlier, yeah, we've got a day off tomorrow. So Ferguson's going to be ready. Loisaga, Holmes, all these guys. Ian Hamilton. Ian Hamilton threw six innings the first there are two innings the first six days. He pitched multiple innings today. He's got the day off tomorrow. He's going to be ready to go. So we're looking really good going into the home opener. And and I would hate to be a Blue Jay. <laughs> and, and I Tori Lav, Lavulo, I think is how you say it. Like Lavello. Lavello. He's a yeah. really good manager. I'm not trying to mm-hmm. like say he's not, but I'm so much like I'm obviously happy the Yankees won for obvious reasons, but now realizing because in the moment kind of lost in the sauce, not realizing that they actually pinch hit for blaze who hit a bomb earlier in the game and like honestly had a good series and is a good player. I I mean, I like seeing over management and this micromanagement get punished and he got punished today. That's really what happened. I mean, it seems to me like I'm not saying Moreno wins the game, but to put yourself in a position where the pitcher has to hit in the final, you failed as a manager for that day. And yeah, there's no I, question about that. And I think Boone managed a really good game. I had some, you know, minor gripes where if I didn't have a show, I'm probably not even voicing them, you know? So that's, that's good stuff. But then the, you know, the off day is going to be helpful. It's a one Oh five uh, Eastern time start on Friday. And uh, Stroman gets to go against what? his former team. 105 Eastern time on a Friday? I really wish... Hear me out when I say this. I, even though, as you know, I don't, I don't work in the workforce. I make my own hours. I hate this. And I hate this because you have these idiots that will take a picture of Yankee Stadium, right? They'll, you know, they'll, they'll take a screenshot of the broadcast and be like, No one's going to Yankee games. And it's like, no one, like, oh, baseball's dead. Baseball isn't dead. And people are not going to Yankee games. People are working. It's 105 on a Friday. Even if you get out early, it's New York City traffic on F4. You know, today's game didn't make sense either. How many people on the East Coast, the average person who watched this game is in New York. And it was a bizarre time. They saw this game at 340. This game started at 1240. I stayed up late last night. I woke up, cooked lunch, cleaned the kitchen, and then the game was in the sec- like the first inning. Yeah, and you're like, what, what is that? What What is the scheduling? I don't see. I don't understand if we don't have events at Yankee Stadium, for instance. Like you don't have concerts and stuff, and they do. I get that, but why? Why can't we just have seven o five? Why can't we have a consistent seven o five? It's on the East Coast. I understand the West Coast different. You don't want to have a straight up ten o'clock game for the East Coasters, but seven o five. Why can't that just be it? And four o five on you know weekends. Well, I mean, I guess I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna read the comment section after we post this video and just see how many people get off work at one o five Eastern time because <laughs> I actually want to know who those people are so that I can quit whatever I do and start doing what they do. Hey, because did, did you that's see a really good schedule? The Yankees were were uh, practically begging us to uh, buy tickets to this game. Grandstand four dollars for this game. For what game? This game. This exact game against the Blue oh, Jays. Oh, because of the time. Yeah, dude, that's what's yes. going to happen. So, yes. man, I might go to some of these games. Perks of, uh, you know, creating my own hours. Yeah, and you can mail me some Joe's Pizza while you're down there. <laughs> Joe's is good. Um, yeah, so what's your prediction So for this home opener? Stroman's obviously on the mound. He's going to be juiced. I think Stroman's going to be excellent. I really do. Stroman against his former team. Yeah. I'm going to say Stroman, Stroman goes seven. I'm going to say he goes seven. Again, okay. um, 
Yankees win nine to two. Oh, it's a beatdown. Well, I think they're gonna just absolutely marauder Kikuchi. I don't. I don't. I really think they're gonna come out with the off day. And, booty cheeks. I mean, come on. It is literally Yankee <laughs> Stadium home opener. You got Juan Soto. I think Soto is going to be going off the whole Yankee Stadium, despite the fact it's 105 and it's going to be lacking attendance, so to speak. This is the opener, though. So that'll be the day where people will be like, I'm not going to work. I'm going to Yankee Stadium. You can't do it every day, but you're doing it for the home opener, right? So I think the whole Yankee Stadium is going to be barking like it's just going to be straight dogs. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's my how- fellow listeners, can you please nine tweet and two. me? Nine, nine and two. two. That's a beat down. Can you guys please tweet me and just say Kabuti and I'll know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> and you will laugh. <laughs> and I will laugh. I will retweet the hell out of that. I mean, that's just so funny. I don't care. I will, I will follow back if you do that. I will follow you if you tweet me, Kabuti. Um, yeah. So that's how I see it. Uh Blue Jays didn't look particularly good against uh Tampa. They didn't look good against Houston. I mean, they got no hit against Houston. <laughs> True story. So, um yeah, Has I like Lottie Jr. figured it out yet. No, but I, he had another um memeable quote. Oh, what'd he say? He said something like, "This is my year." <laughs> well, so, you have to remember. So it's just a it's just a clean progression. Last year it was we have a preview to the full for the full show. Yeah, and then the full show was what was it fourth place or was it third place? I, I, I couldn't forget. remember. But he yeah, said, so "This is my year," and yeah. then they got no hit. <laughs> this is just, his year. He's gonna hit two seventy. It's so funny. And look, I have nothing against the guy. I just think it's hilarious because I mean, he's a walking meme right now. Uh, well, forgot they got just Justin Turner, quotes. by the way. They did get Justin Turner. Is he starting at third base still? Uh, I believe so. He's actually leading the team in batting average. George Springer. Oh, so that's how bad it is. Who we all love. George Springer. Yankee fans. I absolutely love that dude. Yes. Um, leading the team in homers. Uh, Barreos, who I think... Bur- so Bur- Barreos, are they going to see him? I think they will. That's what I was actually trying to see was that obviously we're facing Kabuti in game one, but then what happens after that? So, and okay, I got it for you out. right here. So Kevin Gosman versus uh, Clark Schmidt and okay. then Luis Heal against Francis. So they're not even going to see Barreos. <laughs> well... This is just one of those series where the Yankees got to bring the bats out. If the bats come out, this series is pretty much over before it starts. Oh, so, you mean you're not excited? You're you're not uh you're not worried about Bowden Francis who has a 11.81 ERA? It is really interesting that people have routinely said that the Toronto Blue Jays are this swept on or this slept on organization. Just because people aren't predicting you to win the division doesn't mean you're slept on, okay? That's not what that means. Gosman is good. I'll I'll, I'll give him that. Oh, absolutely. So, so Gosman could be a problem, but I think they went two out of three. Definitely. I think they went Friday and Sunday for sure, which is our job to win the series. Yeah. You're not just going to sweep everybody that you consider to be better than Um, Schmidt versus Gosman though, could be tough. Like Gosman could get, because Gosman gives them fits historically, by the way, that is the only 705 game in the series. 105 on Friday, 135. Also, why 135? Why not just 105? The 30 different 30 minutes really make that much of a difference on Sunday. It's really uh, just bad scheduling. Oh, uh, dude, the, I think baseball is the worst scheduling in any sport. Um Miami on Monday at Yankee Stadium, 205. Oh, well, I guess no one's gonna watch that one because isn't Miami 0 and 7? Yeah, another one where like four dollar grandstand, forty dollars section one hundred. <laughs> yeah. That's that gonna be a bobblehead day. I mean, Miami got just farted on this week from the the Los Angeles Angels. They All you need to know is that Lazardo pitched and yeah. they lost by like eight runs. <laughs> and Lazardo, by the way, both Jake and I both think he's a very good pitcher. Very yes. Good. Pitcher. so that wasn't so my point my point is when you lose yeah. yeah that's not that's not ideal um great so yeah and then with with that they have so the yankees are expected to have cortez rodon and stroman for that series lazardo they will get on monday um 
puck is on Tuesday and weathers is on Wednesday and then off day on Thursday. And then they go to Cleveland and they will face uh 50 year old Carlos Carrasco. He's not actually 50. Oh, cookie <laughs> cookie's still pitching. Yeah. Yep. Okay. He's uh you he's never really know there. what you're going to get from him because obviously he's a vet and he can always, for whatever reason, he's given them problems before. Back. Yeah, he's always a guy that is linked to the Yankees too around trade deadline time. I never want him, but he's always linked to the Yankees. Um, True. I'll I'll say this though, you know, if if it's Carrasco, that means the Yankees are going to face McKenzie and your guy Justin Bieber. Oh, well, first of all, okay, so you're talking about McKenzie from Cleveland. So Yeah, he's really okay. good. Yes, he's got a very good fastball. One of those guys where he's Big throwing 94, 95, and you have no idea why guys can't catch up to it. High spin rate. He's, he's off to a bad start underrated. this year, but still, you know, yeah. Well, I'm still I'm still uh still rolling with him. So he's he's very good. Bieber's and been unhittable to do their thing against him, but yeah, Justin Bieber on the mound. I'll never call him Shane Bieber. <laughs> no, he'll never but, be Shane Bieber again. Yeah, after Jake uh, calls him Justin Bieber every time I tell him. Tie for, anyway, for first and um, wins. Yeah, I really like the matchups that the Yankees have got going, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, tie for first and wins, Justin Bieber. Tie for first in ERA. Tie for first in Ks. Like, bruh. <laughs> Justin Bieber's just straight dealing. My Siri is just going off my ear right now. That's so funny. I All can right, tell now you, yeah, it, se- it seemed like you were you couldn't hear what I was saying, but yeah, nope. uh, basically Justin Bieber has been dominant. He's first in strikeouts. Justin he's Bieber. first in wins. He's first in ERA. I, Shane Bieber. We got to be somewhat professional, but they also have uh, Tanner Bibby in the the rotation. So they got Bieber and Bibby. Okay, I don't know who that is. I know Mike <laughs> Bibby. He's an NBA basketball player. I don't know who that is. I mean, he used to be an NBA basketball player. I don't think he's we'll still We'll do our full NBA. scouting reports before the series, and, and we'll know exactly who he is, and we'll pretend to know exactly who that guy is by the time the series starts. I promise you guys. Yeah, so that's going to do it. A lot of fun, as always. Uh, Yankees win 6-5 to five in 11 innings. We'll get you guys ready tomorrow for a fun series against Toronto. Um, you could follow us at Yankees Unloaded. You can follow me at JK Bogan. You can follow Gary at Gary Sheffield Jr. on all social media. But until next time, you guys take care and go Yankees. And like this video. Oh,